So I opened up my email inbox on Friday morning to find this message there awaiting me. Came from West Point Gray United Church, one of my former congregations, and it's a notice about how they are going to spend their Friday along with the Baptists, the Roman Catholics, the Presbyterians, and the Anglicans in West Point Gray. January 20 marks the inauguration of the new President of the United States, a date that is symbolic of the uncertain times that are happening around the globe. How are we to live and respond faithfully in a time of increased racism, forced migration, conflict, misogyny, and injustice? The West Point Gray Ministerial Association, a group resident representing all the churches in West Point Gray, invites you to a time to explore together what it means to live faithfully in these turbulent times. We welcome you to participate in any or all of the following a prayer vigil for two hours during the inauguration from two to four, then a multi-ethnic potluck dinner, and in the evening a speaker from VST reflecting on living faithfully in turbulent times. I'm glad I got the message on Friday because I'd finished my sermon on Thursday. (laughs) And it fits in exactly with what I want to talk about today. Friends, as we look at our world in the third week of the year 2017, I see that we're in deep waters. This week, a man takes the Oval Office in Washington, a man who has stood before an electorate and shown them and the world that he is an out-and-out bully. We are holding our collective breath as to what will transpire in the coming years from this psychopathic billionaire. But sadly, there is so much more. Internationally, we see new walls being built up between nations and refugees being ignored. These political stances are winning elections. We are in deep waters. The UN has been drawn into the blame game around Israel. The Koreas are light years away from reunification. At least little Cyprus is finally talking reunification, and that's taken only 45 years. Syria, it's experiencing chaotic destruction thanks to internal and external forces. In Asia, governments are focused on control and power issues. And I haven't even mentioned South America nor Africa. Close to home, the opiate crisis seems beyond control and is affecting so many households. Housing costs aren't reachable for too many Canadians. And environmentalists fly thither and yon for photo ops or to attend conferences to demand that all the oil be left in the ground and then fly home again using more jet fuel. Please, would someone explain to me the integrity in that? I'd be so impressed with Ms. Fonda and Chief Phillips if they'd gone to Alberta by solar power. And on the personal level, this is where it brings tears. There are too many times that we're in over our heads, knowing the waters are deep. I mention only one example, and it's that dreaded, and difficult time when alone with a friend you find them telling you they're dying and you don't know what to say or what not to say and you feel that you're in over your head feeling that you didn't prepare thoroughly enough 
for the conversation, simply you don't know enough or you can't seem to be enough for them. Death and dying, family tragedy, damaged friendships, shattered relationships, deep, deep personal waters. So as I look at our world in the third week of the year of 2017, I see a need for us to take our own evolution in hand because things seem to be getting more urgent. Too often the idea is that we must leave this development of humanity to God or to some force beyond our control. But if we follow the one who said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, then opting out and leaving it to God is a cancellation of both our own potential and our own responsibility. It's like putting down a book before it's finished because we don't like the truth it's teaching us. It's like walking off the job early in the afternoon instead of finishing the day's work. Such copping out thinking is in effect believing that the mind of the universe regards us as children to be dragged along willy-nilly. Take it or leave it. Just tread water when you're in over your head. But that, I think, is a formula for disaster. We who follow the teaching of Jesus Christ can be ever so thankful that he taught, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And because we follow this Jesus, then the same must be honored by each of us. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's called Christian responsibility. And this is part of of our covenant. But you say there are some signs that progress is being made in a world of toward a world of justice and peace. Some progress towards a godly time when the lion and the lamb can be together. But I see it this way. It's like three Angela Merkel steps forward followed by two and three quarter Brexit steps backward, or maybe even more steps backward to come. We hold our breath. The question seems to be in which direction are we moving, forward or backward? I hope humanity is evolving forward steadily. But isn't it time to wake up and realize that our lives are about much more than the pursuit of happiness or simply finding comfort while we put in our years, enjoying our lives, until the sun sets? The way I see it, these deep waters we have, we have before us an incredible opportunity and an inescapable duty. We need to hammer day and night, on one fundamental theme. And that theme is not about saving souls or pastoring the feeble or even social action. The first and foremost call from God is to drum the truth into people about who they really are. We shouldn't be wasting Sunday sermons on a simple morality in which we let others make decisions telling us what to do and what to be and what to believe. Think of how many people go home from churches with only the most meager pickings to chew on for spiritual fare. It's all well-meaning and perhaps harmless in its own simplicity, but hardly the way to nourish 
a vibrant and vigorous approach to global, social, and personal problems. Each of us needs to be confronted constantly with the truth that we are the bearers of the divine presence of the living God within our hearts and minds. We are of God. God works through us and others by the Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. We are illumined and sustained by the true light that gives light to every human being who comes into the world. We are the children of the King of Kings, and yet so often we go about our living only half awake to that. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us. The Christ is within. That stands for the divine presence in each one of us. And it can't be stated too often that when you look at every major faith in the world, it reveals that they too bear at the center a similar teaching. However differently they choose to describe or name it, the more one studies other religions comparatively, the more one becomes impressed with the universality of the central belief in each, that each child of God possesses a mark of divinity within. And once this is grasped and fully applied to ourselves and our relationships with others, everything begins to change. Gone are the old labels, the old divisions based on creeds, based on pre-enlightenment thinking or on rituals, no matter how odd those rituals might appear to us. Once you grasp you are a child of God, with the Spirit of the Lord upon you, free to live in God's creation in wonder, with justice for all, in loving relationships with others, family, friends, and strangers. Once that's grasped, gone are all the judgments of those who worship differently or who fail to jump through the hoops of your own belief system. The recognition of what it really means to be completely human, in other words, to have grasped that the secret of our humanity lies in our potential for God in us and through us, means we don't need walls to separate nor factions to divide. No, the result's not then a boring sameness. The result, rather, is a basic, common, bedrock anchoring of of a spiritual core upon which justice and harmony can build. But perhaps you're not sure even about the search for God. Well, I firmly believe that seeking God is an innate craving, an essential human need. A woman in her midlife tells the story of her dying mother. The daughter was a non-believer, and she told the story this way. I don't know if my mother prayed, but I do know that my mother, who had terminal cancer, had the certainty that she was going home, as she called it, where her long-gone parents and my sister were. It was a comfort that I envied. As I watched her slip away a few days after Christmas, I could be grateful for the unending kindness of nurses and drugs like morphine. But when she was gone, it felt like a black hole had opened. And then, as now, I longed for faith. But suddenly, it struck me that That essential human need, longing for faith, might just be proof that God does exist. And that's exactly what an observant Jewish friend of mine argued 
He said, we have an innate craving for food and for sleep and for love. And so perhaps a desire to live in the light of a higher power is neither an accident nor of our own design. That built-in yearning is there because there is something worth yearning for. It's this kind of logic that my mother, a student of Jesuits, would have loved, she said. I recall a fascinating conversation I had some years ago with a Russian Orthodox priest about what it meant to him to fear the Lord. He said to fear the Lord is not about fearing the wrath of God, nor is it about abiding by a biblical legal system endorsed by God, the cosmic cop who flashes signs that warn you your life is being checked by radar. He said this is how many people who speak about biblical morality portray God, and that is wrong. In his thick Russian accent, he went on to say, instead of imagining God as a cosmic cop, Imagine God as a lover with whom you have a committed, exclusive relationship. To fear God is the fear of not wanting to hurt the one you love. To fear God is the fear of damaging what is most precious to you. To fear God is wanting to care for the one who loves you absolutely and unconditionally. He quietly concluded, that is what it it means to fear the Lord. Oh, the waters are deep, and we we are in precarious times. Do not be afraid of who you are, but rather, Fear the possibility of hurting the one who loves you so dearly. And if that one has asked us to care for each other, to love kindness, to do justice, and walk humbly with our God, then we know the covenant we have been baptized into. We know the waters are deep. So in this now moment, As we stand at the threshold of tomorrow, know that you are accepted and called by the one who sees you as you are. Say to that one who loves you, send me. Send me to care for those whom I I know and those whom I don't know. Send me to support and to heal and to feed Send me to find ways to live authentically with those in or near the circle of my life. Send me into that precarious posture of prayer. Send me into your fullness of life, for the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. When we accept that God's Spirit is upon us, working through us, We are boldly taking evolution in hand. May God grant us all the power and the joy and the love we need for the remarkable life that God has given us. Let us pray. O God, whose longing is to reconcile the whole universe inside your love, pour out your abundant mercy upon each of us and upon your church. This we ask through the love of Jesus Christ, which already surrounds us, 
and the Spirit of the Lord, which is already within us. Amen.